Welcome to Tangled Roots, stories navigating youth and family systems. Brought to you by the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth, and Family Mental Health, NTAC. Schools, juvenile justice courts, and child welfare services can be daunting for children and caregivers. New environments, unfamiliar instructions, and the need to trust new people can feel overwhelming. In this podcast series, we hear from those who've navigated these tangled roots through different systems. Each episode shares real life experiences of youth, young adults, and families who experienced trauma or living with mental health needs. Our storytellers include individuals from various backgrounds, offering unique insights into their journeys through these complex systems. In today's episode, we'll hear from Lisa as she reflects on the impact of labeling children with special needs, the importance of community support, and how her experiences in early childhood education have shaped her approach to advocacy. When I think about my journey of advocacy, I think about uh, when it started and where I am now today. It started with the word bully, and I remember the day like it was yesterday. So excited to pick up my son from his family child care provider, just so I could hold him and squeeze him. And I remember his provider coming to the door, and she greeted me with, your son is a bully. He's biting. He's hitting. I don't know what to do. And I just remember saying, man, bully is such a harsh word. You know, how do we even get here? And so from that day forward, um, the calls, the text messages, the daily, the daily grams that was so sweet at first now had becoming this whole system of reporting out behaviors. And I almost remember feeling like it was a setup to expel him from her family child care home. And I remember sharing with his dad, like, we got to figure something out. You know, these messages are becoming more prevalent every day. And I want to make sure that she's able to care for my baby in the way that she did when she started a year ago. And um, it didn't happen. It, it, It didn't happen. The calls continued. And so at that time, we made the decision, let's start the research and just look, let's look at other preschools. At the time, I was working for Part C Early Steps. I was doing early intervention and I was going in homes, building capacity with families. And so I knew that there weren't any developmental concerns happening with our son. But by doing so and working in that environment, I met with a lot of families and one family had referred this particular preschool that was considered high quality. So I reached out to the owner operator and we had this long conversation. I shared about where he currently was enrolled for preschool. And she was like, well, come on, you know, come by, get a tour so you can see our mission, our vision, what we believe in and all these great things. Went to the school. I was sold. I felt safe. I felt accepted. It was a welcoming environment. I was like, yes, you know, I'm out of here. So we end up, you know, parting ways with the family child care provider. And it was bittersweet because she took care of our son for over a year and she shed tears. And it was kind of one of those situations where it's like we're at a crossroads. You're now calling our son a bully. You helped us raise him. But now we got to put him into a space where he's not labeled. Well, that's what we thought. So we start going to this high quality preschool in our neighborhood and things were great. Things were great the first year. Everything was going well. And then I would say six months to a year in, the calls started and the notes started. And it was, they never used the term bully, but it was like, hey, he's flying today. Or um, he's struggling listening today. He's been hands-on today. He's been pushy today. And it was something every day, the buildup. So by that time, I had stopped working for Early Steps, Part C, Early Intervention, birth to three families, and I start working for Head Start. So I'm still, I'm overseeing the disabilities and mental health service area at this point. So I'm still doing the work. I'm still in the field. And so I knew the questions to ask. And so the owner operator was always careful about what those calls sounded like to make sure it wasn't a slippery slope of expulsion. And it was just overwhelming, to say the least, to get calls every single day about your child having challenging behavior or what we know, the behavior that's really challenging the teachers and the staff. And so the call started. And then after the call started, the assumptions started. Well, you know, we think that he may have hearing loss. You know, he doesn't listen. So what did I do? Because of my privilege with my health insurance, I can go anywhere, scheduled an appointment with the audiologist, and he passed it with flying colors. 
The next assumption was, I think he may be having seizures because he just sits and daydreams all day. We're not quite sure what's happening, but something's happening. Went to the pediatrician, and that's where we learned that he was having benign tics, which is associated with um, children that are neurodiverse that live with ADHD. So, okay, there's no, no cure for this, but let's go ahead and put some strategies in place to redirect when these things happen or ignore it. Then we had him evaluated for speech therapy. He passed his speech screen, okay? So all these assumptions come and trying to rule out what's really happening. Why is this kid, quote unquote, flying, right? Then I remember my ex-husband and I were trying to figure out, well, now what, now what? So we made sure that we kept him active in sports because we knew, okay, he's, he has high energy. So let's tune into this high energy, but also looking into occupational therapy. So we started occupational therapy and we even pursued cognitive behavior therapy because we're like, we got to figure out what's happening, what's happening, because we didn't know how to navigate this tangled route that we were in. And the pivotal moment, was on the soccer field. I'll never forget it. I remember every moment like it happened yesterday. The whole team was listening to the coach and they were supposed to stand still with their one foot on the ball. And here my son is doing back flips like a ninja turtle. Okay. Cause he's into action figures. And my ex-husband and I, he looked at me, he said, you see what I mean? And it was pivotal because I think I had been in denial, not ready to accept that our son was different. And I think it was just a lot of fear that had set in. I thought, what are, my son is about to be labeled, and I don't know what that's going to look like. How can I protect him? Fast forward, after the soccer game, full of energy, the energy never settled. I mean, just kind of all over the place doing backflips. And, you know, I celebrated those moments. So we're in the local grocery store in the deli line. And I remember this woman being in front of us, and her son clearly had ticks. He had this repetitive movement with his head, with his wrist, with his hands, his fingers. And I said, excuse me, ma'am, does your son have ADHD? And we spoke for 45 minutes. And basically he had ADHD. I think he may have been diagnosed with autism. He had Tourette syndrome. He was seeing a neurologist. And so I was like, oh my gosh, my son has benign tics. And we're thinking it may be ADHD. We're not quite sure. I've been doing my own research. So she gave me the information and we, um, we made the appointment to the neurologist and it was a very emotional day for me because, you know, we had to start the process or so the school would do a survey. We would do a survey at home and they were almost identical. Then we got the diagnosis that he had ADD, ADHD, attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now they combine it into one. I just remember my heart sinking. I remember my heart sinking and now we're talking about medication and intervention. And I just thought to myself, what do I go from here? So fast forward, I met with my sorority sisters who were pharmacists and we got together, start talking about medications and started the journey. But I look back to where it started. It started with the word bully. And then I literally had to figure out how to navigate this space. Right. He passed all his developmental screeners. There were no developmental delays and he was facing preschool expulsion. And so here we are today. He's, still, he's doing really well in seventh grade, and I'm still having to advocate for him. He has a 504 plan under the IDEA law, and it's still a process. So when we look at advocacy, it's always a start. But then we look at where is the finish line? What does the finish line look like? If I don't do anything else while I'm here on earth, I want to leave families with hope, and I want to leave them with courage. Now that you know what you know, what can you do to advocate for your child and do it in a way where you're taking up space, you're asking hard questions, you're challenging bottom line policies, and you're being the voice for the voiceless. And so that's my goal. Thank you for listening to Lisa's story on this episode of Tangled Roots. Lisa and her son's experience highlight the impact of early intervention, the courage to advocate, and the hope that comes from finding the right resources and support. We hope Lisa's story encourages you to support and advocate for children with similar challenges and to recognize the power of perseverance and compassion. For more information on early childhood mental health and more, check out this episode's show notes. Please continue exploring this podcast series and visit the NTAC website for more upcoming events and learning opportunities. At NTAC, 
We believe all children, youth, and families living with and impacted by mental health challenges have access to the resources and opportunities they need to thrive in a comprehensive and equitable system of care. We promote access to evidence-based and community-driven solutions while uplifting diverse voices through inclusive trainings and resources. We are dedicated to creating spaces for providers and community leaders to gather, learn, share insights, and build a national support network. This podcast is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, as part of the Financial Assistance Award SM-20008 National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth, and Family Mental Health Cooperative Agreement. The information and content are those of the podcast guests and do not represent the official views of, nor an endorsement, by SAMHSA, HHS, or the U.S. government.